Good morning, everyone. I'm Maria Volpe. I'm a professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, where I teach conflict resolution courses. Welcome to this monthly breakfast that's co-sponsored by the Association for Conflict Resolution of Greater New York and the City University of New York Dispute Resolution Center at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. I started these breakfasts after 9-11 as a means of bringing us together as a community. And we met at John Jay until March 2020. As of April 2020, when the pandemic hit, we moved the platform to this virtual space. Today is our 256th breakfast <laughs> since 9-11. Um, all of these breakfasts are recorded and the recordings are now posted on www.acrgny.org and www.jjay.cuny.edu front slash dispute resolution <laughs> so you can rewatch uh, or watch those that you didn't see uh, since we started taping in April 2020. Each month, these breakfasts are made possible by a wonderful team of colleagues that I work with, Julie Denny, Matthew Latimer, Nikki Borofsky, and Emily Skinner. Today, we are really delighted to have with us a wonderful colleague who is new to New York, uh, but she does have some roots uh, from New York. And Andrea, you can tell us uh, more about your New York connection. Uh, just before we got started here, uh, Andrea and I reminisced on when we met, and I, I can remember when she went to Marquette in um, Wisconsin, and that was 26 years ago, she told me. I can remember when you left um, Harvard and Chris Honeyman introduced us, so wow, decades now, no longer days or months or years. Um, so we're so delighted to have you. Welcome to, back to New York, Andrea, uh, as one of our colleagues. And now to more formally introduce her, I am going to turn this over to Julie. Good morning, everyone. Andrea Kupfer Schneider is a professor of law and director of the Kukin Program for Conflict Resolution at the Benjamin N. Cardozo School of Law at Yeshiva University. She has taught dispute resolution, negotiation, ethics, and international conflict resolution for more than 25 years. That dovetails nicely with what Maria just told us. Um, she has published many law review articles and chapters and books on negotiation, gender, international conflict, and dispute systems design. She's co-written books with Leela Love and Carrie Menkel Meadow and Michael Moffat. And I'm not going to read you all the titles she's written, but she's written a ton of books. Um, uh, yeah, it's a long list. Um, she was named 2009 Woman of the Year by the Wisconsin Law Journal. And in 2016, she gave her first TEDx talk entitled Women Don't Negotiate and Other Similar Nonsense, Hints of What's to Come Today. Um, she's named the 2017 recipient of the ABA Section of Dispute Resolution Award for Outstanding Scholarly Work. She's a member of the American Law Institute. She's a graduate of Princeton and her JD she got from Harvard Law School. And I can't tell you all the things I've skipped in reading this bio. I think you'd probably rather hear from Andrea than me. So take it away, Andrea. We're delighted you're here. Thanks so much, Julie. That's very kind of you. Uh, and it is, uh, as Maria said, great to be back in New York. I love hearing about everybody moving in. Um, let me just say that moving from like a house in the suburbs to a one bedroom in New York, <laughs> it's adorable. Um, luckily, uh, in, in, well, in many ways, uh, my husband didn't come, um, not, I mean, not a luckily thing, happy 
go back and forth, but it did mean that I did not need to pack up the entire house to fit uh, in the bedroom, just my clothing, um, which was in and of itself. Enough, but, yes, uh, yes. Very happy to be here in New York and uh, be back. And yesterday was the last day of classes here at Cardozo. So I can't believe that I am already a uh, semester into uh, living in New York and, um, and loving the lovely sunny weather. And, uh, and if you hear any noise outside, they're striking across the street, which is super fun to be. Uh, it's the um, new school right across the street that they are you know, car honking and pounding and um, yay labor unions. So, uh, so that's, you know, all the fun of uh, living in New York. Um, and uh, in addition, being able to connect uh, back with Maria, with many of you, I see a few other uh, familiar faces. Um, what I want to do is spend some time, I, I have slides, I want to present a little bit of the work and kind of give everybody an update on some of the latest research on gender and negotiation and what things we know and what things we don't know um, with a totally casual, um, if there's a question about a slide or a particular study or something like that, I'm happy to stop and answer questions. Um, I'm probably not gonna see the chat, so it's gonna be uh, permission for Julie or um, Emily or somebody else to feel free to interrupt and just say like, hey, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I'm happy to do that. Uh, and otherwise my goal is to leave plenty of time at the end to dig into anything uh, in general that anybody has any questions about, um, you know, broader questions of what the pandemic has done and what do we think now about all of this, uh, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, take at the end. Um, so I think with that, uh, unless there are questions right away, I'm going to uh, share screen and go ahead and uh, let's see. All right, let me, does that work for everybody? Okay. And of course, as soon as I did that, that's great. But now I've of course lost where I'm supposed to. I was uh, moaning, having fun earlier saying that the uh, joys of having too many screens is that I actually can't figure out exactly where uh, my other little screens are. So hold on just one second here while I get back into this, that. Okay, uh, great. So um, what I wanna talk about is really this overarching question of what sex got to do about it is something that I've been thinking about for some time and got into, uh, I was talking with one of my research assistants the other day and she was asking, you know, how did you get into this? What motivated you in the first place? Um, and I took negotiation first year of law school um, in, in the early nineties. Uh, and we had, we were going through the negotiation class. It was all very lovely and wonderful. Um, and then we hit uh, what was then called, I think either gender day or diversity day or some other kind of frankly horrific name um, <laughs> of which, right? You're like, wait, what? Um, and so eight <laughs> weeks into the class, are we all of a sudden saying that these are, everything that we've learned doesn't apply to me, like applies differently. Like why were we spending all of this time if we didn't think it applied? Um, and moreover, and more troubling to me at the time, I just didn't, I didn't buy it. Um, this was not what I had seen growing up. There was, uh, you know, in my, in my family dynamic, everybody talked back, everybody negotiated. Um, I don't know that that was exactly what my parents wanted, but it was absolutely the way that we were raised. And so the idea that this, uh, that negotiation is something that we shouldn't um, have engaged in, or that there was some sort of gender differences was totally alien to me, as far as I could tell. Um, and so it just struck me. And then a few years later, I started teaching negotiation myself and noticed that the gender differences I didn't think applied to me did seem to apply to some of my students. <laughs> and that really got me thinking about how we're socialized and where we get our own theories in terms of negotiation. So um, Maria mentioned, or Julie mentioned, I gave a TED talk in 2016, and this was really putting together a lot of the research that I had gone into in terms of gender. Um, I had uh, run a study of lawyers in negotiation 
in 2000 and had looked at gender differences and there weren't any. So I was like, I'm done, yay, all done. I don't need to study gender anymore. Um, but then Women Don't Ask came out and Lean In came out and it seemed like there were a whole bunch of books that um, were blaming women for the pay gap and, uh, and, and really kind of attributing all sorts of larger sociological differences to negotiation. And so it was something that I wanted to dig back into. And that's really the research behind the TED Talk and we'll be talking about uh, much of that today. Um, at the same time, and the other picture you have here on the slides um, are my sons. Uh, and <laughs> it struck me that he's the mom of three boys um, and had spent you know, plenty of time going down the uh, rabbit hole of women in negotiation. Did I really not have anything to say to my kids, my sons, about what they should be thinking about and working on in negotiation? Um, or my half my law students, right? I mean, we were at a 50-50 law school. Do I have no pointers? for boys to men, um, which is really that phase that you know, you're getting law students where they're sort of grown up, but sort of not, right? Frontal lobe, not completely connected by the time they're showing up at law school, maybe by the time they leave, right? There's a lot of professional development that can occur in your early 20s. And did I really not have what to say? Um, so that was really the motivating factor behind digging in um, at the end of the, you know, 2018, 1920, uh, into a broader perspective of gender differences in negotiation and really trying to think about where all of this comes from. Um, having said that, I want to be really clear in terms of caveats that gender is one of those things that we study because we can see it, because it's easy, because uh, we can often tell by people's names in ways that we can't tell anything else about them. Um, and it tends to be a focus when it is and, and remains unclear to me that that is the primary driving factor of anything in terms of how we learn to negotiate. Uh, your family, your birth order, right? We don't sit down across the table and say to somebody, so last born? And you know, grabbed everything before your older siblings, you know, would feed you. Uh, were you the middle child? Were you mediating? Were you the first child? Were you in charge of it? Right. We don't interview people about their birth order. And yet we know that that clearly has something to do in terms of how you communicate um, ethnicity uh, and, and family dynamics and cultural dynamics uh, have a huge set of um, impact and, and influence in terms of what we think is right in terms of levels of, of talking up, of assertiveness, of having your opinion, um, of when you're trained in terms of other skills as well. All of that seems to tie in. And then of course your professional training and your mentors matter as well. Who are you watching negotiate early in your career? What models does that give to you uh, in terms of how you think people should be communicating. And so I just want to flag, we're going to focus on gender because that is what's studied and there's a ton of research out there. And on any given day, I remain unpersuaded that that is the determining factor in anything um, that we're going to see uh, across the table. And of course, as we talk about gender, um, right, we, we it, gender is not binary. Um, many of these studies were conducted when it was. Uh, and so, right, I want us to be looking at all of this on a range of masculine, feminine, alpha, not, right, wherever you are, um, gender, as I said, is just one lens. Um, and modern gendered research asks different questions, frankly, than people did in the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, where a lot of these early studies come from. And so many of the conclusions, uh, things that we hold as, uh, you know, kind of common advice on gender and negotiation, right, are, are conducted, I think, in ways that we would legitimately question today. Um, and there's not a lot of studies out there that are not looking at gender yet as non-binary, um, that are mixing questions, for example, of sexuality and gender and negotiation and doing all of that. So caveat, 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 we are all going to be somewhere on this range. Um, and, right, unclear to me that on any given day, you know, you're meeting the person who's in the middle of the bell curve there, right? So when I share the research, I'm going to share what, what there is known at the moment um, with the hope 
uh, that there's still more research to be done. And I should say that the um, the next article uh, that that I published about gender was really talking specifically about how gender research has been getting a lot of this incorrectly. Um, I'll also say that many of the studies uh, back on gender in the day uh, were done on 18 year olds. Um, and, you know, again, not really sure that that's giving grownups any advice, uh, because most of us do not peak in college. Um, that would be a long way down. Uh, right, so we continue to grow and learn and add to our skills. And again, that's another one of those, uh, I'd say, caveats and problems and concerns. Um, so what I'm going to do today is use the negotiation skills that I particularly study and teach as a way of organizing and walking through some of the gender differences. Um, I'm happy to talk more about why these skills are important versus other negotiation skills. This is a framework that I've used for about a decade in terms of how do we organize the things that are really needed for people to you know, organize their skills, be a more effective negotiator, what they bring to the table and to kind of wrap up all of those things. So I wanna say that this is obviously not the only framework that people can use, but it is, I'm gonna say what a frame, uh, you know, gives us a framework for organizing uh, the gender research here. Um, and so I'll explain what each thing is briefly. Again, if there's a question about what do you mean by this skill versus that skill, I'm happy to answer it uh, and then go through the gender research with this. Um, and I guess the last thing I will say is uh, if some of what I share is frustrating or troubling um, to any of us, uh, I want to say, yeah, yes, that's what got me started on this in the first place, right? This drove me crazy. Uh, and so I think um, kind of recognizing, wait, does that fit? Does that not fit? Are you sure? No, no. I, I think that's an ongoing um I think that's the way that we continue to grow and learn and can, and think about this. I'm not saying that that we are done on any of this, uh, and so I want to uh, you know kind of applaud if if you're feeling uncomfortable or that something doesn't fit. That is what motivated me 30 years ago to say like well, as soon as I get tenure, I'm coming back to this stuff. Like this drives me crazy, um, and I'm not going to say that anger is always healthy, but it's it's really motivating. Um, and so that's definitely where some of the research comes of just that can't be true. Um, and why are we telling people that? And uh, anyway, so just to uh, give all of that as a background. All right, so assertiveness. Um, when I think about assertiveness, I think about assertiveness as both the knowledge of, you know, what do you need to know about the, the case, the rules, the business, the this, the that, whatever it is, the the substance of what you're negotiating um, and it is the presentation it is how you come across in a negotiation uh, that also makes you effective right all you could be brilliant but if you can't open your mouth and talk about it you're not going to be all that effective as a negotiator right so you need both the preparation and the knowledge as well as the ability to talk um, knowledgeably and persuasively about whatever you're trying to negotiate. Um, and historically, uh, we hear that women need to ask more. This was one of the books that got me into thinking about this. Uh, and as I said, Lean In came out. Um, and when this came out, I, I was very curious. Actually, Linda Babcock, who's the author of uh, Women Don't Ask, uh, teaches taught at Carnegie Mellon. Um, I grew up in Pittsburgh, so I would go visit Linda when I was home on vacations and I'm like, all right, tell me the research behind this because I don't see it for lawyers, right? There was no difference in all of the studies when people are looking at practicing lawyers in terms of level of assertiveness on behalf of clients. So what were we seeing here and how, um, and how is she concluding this? And so in lab studies, right? Linda and her colleagues uh, were having college kids come in and uh, one of my favorite is the boggle study, which she talks about in the book. Um, kids play boggle, they figure out an amount, you know, the words there um, and they're given an amount of money. Um, the male students, you know, they would then be told, you know, here's $7. Male students would say, I think I deserve more. I got a lot of, I got a lot of words. I'm a very smart kid. I deserve more. And the women would say things like, wow, that's, less than I thought, or tell me how you determine these things. 
Um, tell me more about the game. Tell me more about the rules, right? That would be counted as not negotiating. And to me, that's exactly, you're like, rather than confront you and say, I want more money now, right? It's going around. It's a different type of negotiation. I don't think it's not negotiating. And so we have these lab studies where when you dig into the details, I'm unpersuaded that that doesn't mean that you're not negotiating or countering, you're just doing it differently. Um, Linda's colleagues also found that women right out of college were less likely to negotiate. Um, again, 22 year olds. And I think it's useful to understand that actually a lot of kids as they are graduating college are not negotiating, right? When you look at law students, I've attract law students negotiating. They don't actually, for many reasons, negotiate their opening salary. Sometimes it's because you're, you know, you're going to the government where it's a set salary or a law firm that's hiring 30 kids at once, you're not negotiating your individual salary. Um, but again, looking at salary negotiations, young women were less likely to negotiate. Um, so let's dig in. First of all, what many of the studies now show is that women will negotiate about more than salary. So while women, young women in particular, are less likely to negotiate about salary, they will negotiate about work hours, about vacation, about what the parameters of the job will be, about where their office is located, about right every other piece of what makes a job livable, enjoyable, so on and so forth. Um, there's a bunch of studies in the 2010s and forward, uh, particularly one out of Australia that showed no difference in the propensity to negotiate among working people, right? So it is one of those things that now we're looking at 25, 30, 35 year olds no difference in the likelihood to negotiate a salary. Um, and we also know that women, that there's no gender difference at all once people are trained. So once you have been cued that either the salary is negotiable or you've been trained in negotiation, um, or frankly, even advocacy. Again, there was no difference in the rate of law students negotiating their first salary, right? Three years of advocacy, the studies aren't showing any difference there. <laughs> It was the first time for everything. Was there a question? Okay. Um, so one of the other things that we've heard here are that women need higher confidence, right? And that that might explain that what's happening, that the women are not setting high enough goals, uh, that women have lower confidence levels. Uh, and here's what the interesting thing is, of course, we, I talked earlier about when these studies are conducted. I'm going to go with eighth grade is not very nice to anybody. Right. Again, not a great time. Middle school was lousy. You may or may not recall that. Um, and for women more than men, that pitches your confidence, which drops through high school and college and then starts to increase. Once you track men and women into their 40s, 50s, in fact, confidence increases um, to match the competence. Uh, and there's study after study showing that men, frankly, in their early 20s have confidence that is not matched by the skill set they have, right? They are more confident. Women don't have confidence up to the skill set that they have. But we are testing kids only at this window of time when they're in their 20s and their early 20s. And then we're making broad statements, societal statements about what's happening in the workplace for working men and women into their 40s and 50s and 60s. It's, it's just not applicable. And so really being careful in terms of when we're looking at these confidence things. Um, and yet what we continue to see is that women are not setting high enough goals. This could be uh, in some way related to confidence. Um, there are two other areas that the research has shown. One is that women don't have the networks to be told what, you know, this is the salary you should ask for. This is how high it should be. So that if you're going into a place and you don't have the market information, the networks, right, all of the things that, again, we would want effective negotiators to have to be able to set high goals. You've done research, you have criteria, you know what the market salary is, so on and so forth, um, that there are still there are still different kinds of professions that are more male dominated and the men going into them are more likely to have a peer or a colleague say, by the way, psst, 
ask for this, ask for this, ask for this, where women don't necessarily have that network. Um, and the other thing is that we've been hearing for 20 years that there's a backlash when women negotiate. Um, I, I had done one article on uh, back in the, in the early 2000s when Hillary Clinton was running for president. And, you know, if you were looking at Clinton and uh, Sarah Palin even back in 2008, right, you had this likability or competence, um, right? You couldn't be both. Uh, and so the public of um, what we see in politics, what we see with female leaders is often this punishment for being assertive, um, even if that's not true in instances in which you're negotiating on behalf of your team, when you're negotiating on behalf of your client. Um, there are plenty of instances where the backlash does not occur and we can train, and I do train, how to deal with that particular fear. In general, um, women right, would still be socialized into fearing um, that being assertive uh, will have some backlash. And so I think there's still some ongoing concerns in terms of if you're fearing backlash, you're going to set a higher, uh, a lower goal. You don't want to rock the boat, as it were, um, and that still could be uh, problematic. Um, on the flip side, of course, if you were talking to men dealing with this, you'd say, all right, men are dealing toward overconfidence. We know that this is a typical negotiation error. They don't admit mistakes. Conflict, conflict escalation can get you into trouble. Um, and in fact, when we talk about bullying, uh, there's now been studies that are showing that men are facing greater backlash than women for aggressive languages in negotiation. And so, again, thinking about as we move into this next you know, generation of people hitting the workspace, um, nobody should be a jerk. I mean, this shouldn't be rocket science, uh, but sometimes a, a good reminder of actually aggressiveness in negotiation is going to have backlash versus being assertive. And some of the early studies that were showing women were getting uh, punished for assertive language, actually it wasn't being assertive, it was being a jerk. Okay, we should both, men and women, be punished for being obnoxious. All right, so that's the piece on assertiveness. Um, and again, I wanna to flip to talk about other negotiation skills because I feel like assertiveness is the skill that we tend to focus on really to the detriment of other negotiation skills. And when we talk about gender differences, we talk about how women need to fix themselves because we're only focusing on assertiveness. And the rest of the things that we're gonna talk about are things where there's very little gender difference, or frankly, women are measured at higher rates and higher skill sets. Um, and so just to put all of that in context, empathy, obviously in the negotiation literature, both having an understanding of the other side and being able to match their emotions. Um, early on in the literature on gender and the ethic of care, uh, there was worry that if you cared about the other side, you would be taken advantage of, others could exploit you, uh, so on and so forth. And again, kind of worried about tying that to gender. Um, but far more recent studies talk about how listening is crucial in negotiation and communication. Better listeners are better liked, not surprisingly. And I love these stories. These are often done, or not often, but this particular study was done on uh, speed dating you know, one of those like five minutes, five minutes, five minutes thing. Um, so I, I tell my students, here's a tip when you ask questions. Don't talk about yourself for five minutes. Ask about the other party, right? You're going to be better liked. You're going to get dates. Um, we know, though, that this is true for customers dating, right? Better listeners gather more information. Um, some of the work in terms of persuasion shows that good listening itself is what is needed to change minds. And women are considered stronger listeners. So when you focus on the skill set of what is needed for empathy, women are the ones that have this skill set. When we talk about mirroring emotions and building rapport, uh, we know that flattery works over and over, even when people know they're being complimented and so on and so forth. That kind of, how do you schmooze people? How do you build rapport? Um, it is still socially easier. Women are the ones who are negotiating the shoes, the clothes, the like, oh, that's lovely what you're wearing today. Um, and again, that accrues benefit to you in the negotiation as well. Um, flexibility, third negotiation skill. Uh, we know that you 
need creativity, really, you know, going back to getting to yes in every other negotiation book out there in terms of coming up with many options, of being flexible, of trying to figure out different ways of getting things done. Um, there are zero studies that show any gender difference. Um, the differences are in how people think about creativity, but not in the level of creativity. Um, and yet what we know is that in order to come up with lots of options, you need information, you need to be able to gather information. And so that gathering information could really again be read as something that women are better at. Carrie Mankle Meadow 30 years ago uh, encouraged us to reread the Carol Gilligan story as a story on flexibility. Um, and if you remember, Carol Gilligan psychologist wrote uh, in a different voice looking at how young boys and girls were asked about a particular dilemma. This is a, the, the wife is dying. The husband is faced with a dilemma of should he steal the drug uh, or not? Um, and Jake, the quintessential 12 year old boy says, um, yes, he should steal the drug in order to save his wife's life, right? Ethic of justice, that a life is more valuable than money or stealing and you should do this. And Amy, uh, which was the name given to the quintessential 12 year old girl says, well, why? Why wouldn't you just sit down and talk to the pharmacist? And if you get arrested for stealing, then how are you going to take care of your sick wife anyway? And wouldn't the pharmacist want to work something out? And what does the wife want in this situation, right? She fights the hypo. She says, this is a stupid problem. Can we find a different way around this? And for those of us who've been in dispute resolution land for a long time, know that right we wouldn't ever mediate this like justice, that's the only thing. Um, we read this as a flexibility story. Uh, and the interesting thing is, again, these, these are very old psychological studies dating back even into the 50s, that there is this socialization of let's think differently about this, let's get everybody together. Um, we know that women uh, managers in leadership uh, are much more likely to consult with others before deciding. And so it's not the brilliant person in a room deciding themselves, they're gonna consult with their leadership team. And of course we know that gets you buy-in, that's a more effective managerial style. What that means in terms of creativity is that you've actually gathered more information as well. Um, the last thing that's really interesting in terms of decision-making, uh, and I particularly love the, these studies are out of Great Britain. Um, it shows that when, uh, men get hopped up on testosterone, they don't make really good decisions. Um, men are really emotional. Um, I love saying that. Uh, and so the, um, that hormones actually have far more of an effect on men in decision-making than women in decision-making. Um, and they studied the traders in the city of London looking at when they had a great day um, you know, or a terrible day in stock trading one way or another because of the testosterone flood, um, they were much more likely to make high risk decisions, um, take risks that were unwise. If you wanted your money to be handled safely, you should actually be giving it to women, um, was some of this. And again, when we think about decision making, uh, something to, uh, you know, that women are smoother, that the hormonal balance uh, in terms of impacting decision making uh, tends to be oxytocin, which is, you know, happy, happy hormone, um, as opposed to testosterone leading to risk. Uh, so kind of interesting when you're thinking about how you make decisions. All right. Fourth element is something called social intuition. Uh, and this is really coming out of um, the uh, Malcolm Gladwell, Daniel Goleman, all of these cognitive psychology, behavioral economics, really thinking about how people have intelligence uh, across the table to manage a negotiation in nonverbal, paraverbal, and verbal ways. So when we think about nonverbal, how close are you to one another? Um, early on, Maria was talking about how, right, in March 2020, people did the elbow touch, the foot touch, right? There's still something about that physical contact, which is valuable, um, and it builds rapport. And so if we're moving away from handshakes, what, what are we doing instead? Um, eye contact, really important in American culture for uh, building trust. Um, again, these are cultural in other places around the world, eye contact could be read as threatening, it could be read as challenging in status, um, 
in American culture, eye contact is one of those things that we use to manage trust. Um, paraverbal cues in negotiation. How fast are you talking? What's your tone? Um, is all part of the negotiation and really good negotiators are paying attention to that themselves, for themselves, as well as what's happening across the table. And then the last piece of social intuition would be the verbal itself, not the content of the words, um, but looking at the metaphors. Again, mediators like yourselves, well-trained in this, know you're already picking up. If somebody sits down at the table and they're using war metaphors of Right, I've got a, you know, I've put on my armor and I'm ready to sit down. You're like, hmm, you are viewing this as war, right? If you're talking about a tango, uh, are you talking about construction, right? All of those things uh, are part of what makes you an effective negotiator if you're thinking about the metaphors you're using and paying attention to what they are using as well. So thinking about these cues in social intuition to help smooth the interaction across and for effective negotiators, it's really knowing yourself, what are the symbols, cues that you are setting across? How fast are you talking? And in New York, I get to talk this fast and it's no big deal whatsoever. And maybe in other jurisdictions, I would not be talking that fast because it would really make people crazy. Um, how does the pace differ over the course of the negotiation? And are you paying attention to that, your tone of voice and those things? Are we reading them and what body language signals are they sending across? Uh, is the humor at my expense or is it self-deprecating? And what is that telling me about their comfort level in the negotiation? And then of course, the importance of mirroring and responding to them is this third part of being a, an effective negotiator in terms of using social intuition. Are we matching body language and pace, tone, all of those kinds of things that help the negotiation go more smoothly. So the amazing thing is that in social intuition, on virtually every single measure, women have been measured for years as far better uh, than men. And this is stuff that doesn't get in the negotiation literature in terms of when we think about an effective negotiator. But that's part of why I'm bringing it in here. Um, women are better able to decode body language, facial expressions, to read smiles, um, to understand nonverbal displays. Um, men tend to read smiles as sexual interest. And women read smiles as it's nice to meet you. <laughs> and that is the more accurate read more often, uh, right? So really thinking about what those expressions mean, the emotion, eye contact, smiles, all of those are things that for years and years, uh, women have been measured you know, in, the, in biology as much, much better. Um, part of social intuition is being aware of yourself, understanding what are the signals that you are sending across. Um, and so that self-awareness is higher uh, levels in women as well. Um, mood, right? Again, as neutrals, we are often told to pay attention to, you know, is there food and what's the layout of the room? And what's the, literally, what's the temperature of the room? Again, this is something that women are uh, measured to be better at as this as well. So again, another social intuition skill. Um, the interesting thing is that when you look at hostage negotiation, which is often dealing with, um, and I wouldn't say just men, but you know, alphas, right? So anybody who's kind of on the one side of, of you know, our bell curve on assertiveness. I mean, you've, you know, we know from NYPD, Maria's worked with them for years, uh, FBI, right? If you have already spent years and years being really good at, uh, you know, at being a police officer, the training now is how do you add to that skill set? How uh, can you build rapport? How can you build trust? Um, all of those things is really part and parcel of what uh, hostage negotiation training occurs. So we know that alphas need to bring that skill set and really add their, you know, existing skill set, which is, you know, great at, at, at being on the SWAT team and, and managing your weapons and so on and so forth, right? All of the assertive behavior uh, you want and uh, to be able to add to that. Um, men are more able to read threat than women, uh, but miss other emotions as well. So again, one of those things where you read aggression into these, um, the mood is not as great as well. When you look at, again, some of the studies, anger is more likely to be common between men when they negotiate, women more likely to be happy when they negotiate. Uh, managing that 
tone of the negotiation. And again, tying this back to effectiveness, happy people give you things. People who feel threatened and defensive are less likely to give you the goodies that you need in a negotiation. And so effective negotiators know how to diffuse tense situations, know how to listen carefully, know how to manage the mood. Um, and this is something, again, that women have been measured for years at as much higher at. Um, the last thing that I'm going to cover in terms of skills, and then uh, we have plenty of time for questions and I'm happy to open them up, um, is my uh, magical word uh, called ethicality. Um, and this really is a word that I use to cover really all of the skills that are under, as you, under reputation, trust, trustworthiness, all of the things that you need in a negotiation that have to do with more than just following the rules per se, but really thinking about the impact of reputation in negotiation. We know that if you have a more integrative cooperative reputation, you're more likely to have information shared, um, to have more integrative agreements. Uh, we know that in negotiation, you actually want to build your own trustworthiness uh, to have others know that you're going to say what you mean and mean what you say and carry it out and execute it. Um, and that you actually need to take a leap of faith and trust the other side um, and to work with them as well in the negotiation. Um, and that when we operate from a place of suspicion and we don't trust the other side, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? So all of those are pieces that are needed in terms of making you a more effective negotiator. Um, so this is an interesting, when we look at the gender research, there are pros and cons. Women are assumed to be more ethical. Um, so it leads to a more trustworthy reputation, more information is shared, but it also means that there are people out there that are more likely to try to deceive you, right? So the, the flip side of the coin, um, everybody should obviously be thinking about those, uh, what I call the defense against the dark arts. Um, you know, how do you defend yourself from being deceived, from people who bluff, from, you know, whatever it is, um, and recognizing that at least in studies, women assume that, right, there's the pros and cons of having this um, higher ethical standard. Um, by the way, women are also more punished for ethical violations because you are held to this higher standard. When you violate that standard, there's higher punishments and they've tracked, you know, lawyers at disciplinary bars. Um, you could look at, you know, public figures, uh, insider trading, right? All of these things that we're going to hold women up to that higher standard that could be beneficial until you violate anything yourself. Right, so pros and cons on this side. Um, but again, if you, if people sitting across the table from you are more suspicious of you, less likely to trust you, less information sharing, less integrative agreements. And so men need to be working on how do you build that trust? Uh, how do you build that reputation more specifically, more carefully in a negotiation? Um, because it is not assumed uh, automatically. Um, last thing in terms of ethics and ethical violations, this again goes back to the risk taking and the testosterone studies. Um, in many of the studies, not all the studies, but in many studies, uh, men are more likely to have ethical violations, more likely to skirt the rules. Um, interestingly, the caveats to that have been women on behalf of others uh, are equally like, not more, more than men, but are there aren't gender differences once you're on behalf of another uh, in terms of your ethical violations, but otherwise um, some of the hypothesizing around ethical violations is uh, there's less control, takes a lot of uh, you know, attention uh, to stay focused in the negotiation. If you're tired, if the testosterone's kicking in, so on and so forth, um, more likely to lead to those ethical violations. Um, all right, so I'm gonna review and then we should have plenty of time for questions. Um, so I wanna, as I say, go back to the beginning here. Uh, there's a ton of research out there on gender because it is easy to study. Um, easy to study doesn't make it the best thing to study um, or revealing for any particular person. And so I continue to hope that we push ourselves in all of negotiation research to think about what else we should be looking at and how that can be helpful. Um, 
Again, we tend to study assertiveness uh, because it is easy to measure. Do you negotiate or not? Do you make a high opening offer or not? We play dictator games as, as the only game. Uh, it's really hard to run studies uh, that look more at creativity or at social intuition uh, or at listening or, or things like that. Uh, and yet we know, all of us on this call, know how important the rest of those skills are uh, in terms of negotiation. And so I would continue to say that the best negotiators continue to think carefully about a variety of skills. Um, last bit is just resources. So, uh, and I'm happy to share or anybody can talk to me afterwards about, we you have the TED talk, um, but uh, articles on this and happy to chat more at any time about other resources or studies. Um, so with that, I'm gonna stop the share and give us lots of time to chat. Yeah, there are a couple of questions that have Great. been posted already. Um, Laura Engelhart commented on your studies about bullying. She said she'd like to know more about those because she sees bullies winning more than non-bullies in the corporate world. Yeah, so Laura, it was really interesting. There was some studies that, uh, there was a typical study done um, looking at kind of aggressive language in like 2015. And then these, uh, you know, in the perfect experiment, people re-ran it right after Trump was elected. And the level of aggressive language went up significantly, um, particularly by men. The rate of uh, agreement went down. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't want to say, actually, the negotiation journal did a whole bit on the, the Trump effect. Um, I want to say that was 2019, maybe 2018. Um, you know, and I wrote about it as well, you know, literally bullying from the bully pulpit, um, because it was, it was held as that's an appropriate and effective way um, to negotiate. Um, I think you know, it, it's interesting when you dig into, um, well, Trump prior to his political career, um, you know, this was an example that Bill Urey used in difficult conversations um, as a, you know, real estate developer in the late 1990s, who's who banks had absolutely stopped writing loans to because they're like, forget this, we're bullied, this is ridiculous, right? I mean, that one could hypothesize exactly, therefore, what banks say in Russia one was needed to go get loans from at that point. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the interesting things um, it would be like, who's, who thinks that bullying is more effective and when? Uh, and so there's, you know, I don't want to say it, it's not happening because it's absolutely clearly happening. Um, and I think it might also be hopefully something that decreases over time, particularly when it is not hailed as, you know, the most effective thing we're seeing in politics. But you've got a lot of political leaders who believe that bullying and screaming in a megaphone um, is <laughs> effective. Okay. Jill Strauss asks, if you've looked at racism in combination with gender in negotiation. Um, okay, sorry, Julie, say that one more time. The race have you looked gender, at okay. race? Yeah, racism. have you looked at okay. racism? Yes. In um, combination with gender. So the the sad story is that in most of the studies, there's not enough. I mean, mine's a, mine's an early study in two thousand. Um, and there weren't enough lawyers of color, frankly, to draw conclusions about negotiation, differences in race, so on and so forth. That is changing. Um, there, there are some fascinating studies out of China, for example, um, which reverses our, so, our socialized assumptions. So in China, women are socialized to be assertive and men are socialized to be more cooperative. It's great proof that this is more about socialization than biology. Um, there are, there's definitely separate studies in terms of race, um, Asian women in the workplace uh, and what that means in terms of expectations of 
uh, how you negotiate. Interestingly, and again, not a lot in combination, the, the one or two studies I've seen um, that Black women are actually given more permission to be permission, less backlash um, on being assertive uh, because it is assumed um, that that is, again, you know, that there are assumptions in one way or another uh, that that is, it's seen as more permissive. I'm not saying it's right. Uh, I'm saying there's, there's very few studies out there. Um, and yet we know with intersectionality that that is really crucial and that what advice we might be giving for white women in the workplace versus black women in the workplace versus Asian women in the workplace, right? It's, it's, that's, that's not across the board and that those combinations of gender and race, I actually think an age and position and title all are of, of a magical soup. Um, we see that backlash is reduced when you have high status. Um, and to the extent that status is replicated in race and gender, that becomes a magnifying uh, effect as well. So I would like there to be more studies out there, um, but I think you're just starting to see these. Right, there's a raised hand. Um... I'm trying to balance a bunch of screens. Somebody has a raised hand, I know. How about unmuting yourself and asking your question? Hey, thank you. I, I so appreciate this discussion and all the variables that uh, you've brought up. Uh, I, I think Thanks, they're very valuable. I have found, I, I agree um, strongly about the nature of testosterone I happen to be a, a psychotherapist as well as a mediator, and I've worked a lot with the transsexual, transgender community, and I have worked with uh, what's called F to M, female to male, when uh, my clients have been taking testosterone. And they've often said to me, and these were people who uh, felt that they were uh, benign, peaceful, you know, people who did uh, reasonably, you know, uh, solve communication difficulties. But they would tell me, s several of my clients who were um, going through testosterone treatments would tell me about how much more aggressive they felt, how much more combative they felt, how they were having more arguments with people in their lives, and that. I, I find I, I think research has to be more research has to be done on this because more and more people are taking hormones and having these variables in, in their bodies. Um, how they felt at war that they could see themselves doing activities that they were actually horrified by, but they felt compelled to do uh, to be more assertive, to scream more, or to be more sexually demanding. And uh, it sounds like a cliche, but it, it, it was really a remarkable uh, change that I noticed. So I, I, I do thoroughly believe testosterone has a lot to do with it. Also uh, racial aspects, I'm working with an immigrant uh, who's in a very high financial uh, position. She, she immigrated to this country as a teenager and that the treatment that she received when she did immigrate definitely uh, affects her, her self-confidence, even though she's very capable. So absolutely share that. Yeah. Thanks, Ellen. Yeah. Um, someone comments that women are viewed as complex, which causes us to view them as less assertive. Can you elaborate on that? And how can women come across as more assertive and still be complex. <laughs> so I, I want to unpack that, right? Yeah. <laughs> we, because I, I love that. Um, we should all be viewed as complex. Why would any of us want to be one trick ponies? Um, you know, it, it goes back to the if everything, you know, if all you have is a hammer, everything's a nail. I mean, I would want everybody to have, you know, the wrench and the screwdriver and the hammer and the, mm -hmm. you know, and the leveler and, you know, a toolbox. Um, and so, you know, part of this is, uh, I think, fighting the box that we are supposed to be in. Um, and I think, again, some of the studies on reducing 
backlash uh, for women when they need to be assertive is actually purposely complicating the picture. So going in and saying, you know, here's my I, status, I'm, you know, I'm arguing on behalf of my department, um, and I, you know, my identity is, right, I mean, for me, it's, it's professor and New Yorker, but lived in the, you know, mother of Packer fans, I'm never going to get away with that. It's not like, you know, they, I have, I have three Midwest, you know, Big Ten boys, and when I talk about that, that adds a little bit of nuance or, you know, the amount of time you've spent on the side of a soccer field or that, you know, where I travel all the time or, you know, any of those things or languages that you speak. Um, I think sometimes purposely complicating is a way of when you're asking for things. Um, we know that backlash happens most often when all they see is gender and when there is, and, and when it's tense right, when people get defensive. So if you are building that rapport, complicating yourself, complexifying it, um, I think that's, that is helpful. Um, the other piece of it is, um, I guess I'd ask, why do we want to be seen as more assertive? Um, and I go back, I, I kind of joke, uh, you know, part of how I got into this was, um, you know, with this gender day negotiation. Uh, and yet, you know, I look 30 years later and, you know, there's no male in my family that says, wow, if only Andrea was more assertive, right? I mean, there's no husband, not one of my kids, not my dad's, not like, not nobody, um, right? And that's for all the women in the family. And I'm not sure that, um, you know, we hail assertiveness as the skill. Yes, of course you need to ask. You absolutely, you know, nobody's handing you goodies unless you ask for them. And right, what are the 5,000 other things we bring to the table? Um, and I think some of the leadership studies, uh, if you look at what's happened during the pandemic, uh, and I mean, Harvard Business Review was doing a bunch of these leadership studies both before in 2019 and then 2020, and, you know, really tracking what was seen as successful. Um, the management during the pandemic and in the face of crisis was more about assertiveness, uh, you know, more than about assertiveness, right? It was that team building and communication and trust me, we're going to get through this and how can I be helpful? And women leaders, um, you know, the data is still out there that, you know, female governors, female leaders of countries um, had better communication, more consistent communication, were able to keep their populations healthy, uh, let alone in companies as they were facing crisis. And I think um, assuming that assertiveness is the only hammer, you know, that all we need is a hammer. I mean, I know that's not what you're saying. And I would say, let's, let's make sure that we're singing the praises of all the tools in the toolbox. Um, two things. There's an interesting discussion going on between Beth Abile and Eileen. Um, right. my, Beth Abile says, my experience says that to the extent that Black women are given more leeway to be yep. assertive, uh, you can see that. Uh, yeah, I'm looking at this now. Yeah, um, and Eileen has a different perspective. I, I wonder if you can comment on that. And also, uh, Edil has her hand raised. So after this one, Edil, you're on. All right. No, I would say, I think that both are true. I think, Beth Abiel, you're exactly right in the femininity. I mean, one is in the context of a workplace where, um, again, th there's not a lot of studies, um, but the ones that are out there uh, for, for working women, and again, we're talking 30, 40, 50, right out where um, they're just different expectations. And so that, I love that. I have not used that phrase man et, um, but damn, that's funny. Um, I'm like, oh, that's a good one. Uh, and I mean, the, the hypersexualization is something that we really, you know, we, we see in schools constantly when you're looking at, um, uh, you know, teenage girls, preteens. Um, but I think that's really a different context of um, in the school system and for school punishment and social expectations in your teens and 20s, um, which is not to say that there's not hypersexualization 40s and 50s and whatever, but I think we're also talking, at least what I've seen is that we're talking about different contexts and that 
frankly, both are true for better or worse. Ideal, and then after Ideal, Susan Coleman, go ahead. Uh, thank you for this very interesting uh, presentation. When I was listening to this, this assertiveness being the skill, it just reminded me of calmness being another skill. Now that I live in the UK, I feel like I'm treated like a crazy woman as soon as I speak like this, or I'm a little bit excited, or as you have talked about this tone and voice, yeah. like if you don't speak like an English person, very calm and like this, and no offense to any English person, <laughs> but there is just too much. And I think you start living the other um, bias almost being connected with a woman. Like if she's too assertive, like in this calm country, you know, it's it's like becoming you're a troublemaker, you're a crazy witch and you're this problem kind of. So um, I'm just wondering if you have more on this like voice and tone thing, because what I'm telling you is actually totally opposite of how women behave, because men are more talking like this, like I do now. And right. it's okay for them to talk like this. Um, but if women are the more quiet and nice and soft-spoken type, and unless you confirm to that, and now I'm exaggerating just to show my point, um, it's the opposite. So I would really appreciate if you can elaborate on that a little bit more. Thank you. Sure. No, I, I mean, and I think also the cross-cultural ideal is, is really interesting. I mean, you're coming from Istanbul where, right, I... I actually there right it's like there's hand motions and there's lots of right and yet the way that you talk probably has just as much to do with where you grew up and where your family is and right i mean i regularly joke if you tied my hands behind my back i wouldn't be able to talk like no this is how i make points like what do you mean like blah, 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 blah. Um, and so um you know one is I want to validate exactly we all have different cultural expectations and so this very oh we're going to be very calm um and also then what could you do about it? I mean, one of the things is to say, oh, you know, in Turkey, we all talk with our hands or, um, you know, like you're, you are locating it away from gender and giving it another, another explanation um, if you find yourself that way. Um, or even just sometimes raising it and say, look, I know that, uh, you know, having, having uh, you know, a range in your voice is, is not very British, um, but I'm, I'm not really good at talking in a monotone. And so, you know, like, like let's flag that before you punish me for the like monotone voice. Um, I think conversely for those of us who kind of like, blah, 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 um, when we're quiet and we talk slowly, like that's a sign that I'm really angry. <laughs> like, <laughs> be careful, um, right? Because then I'm so annoyed that I can't, even begin to talk, right? Like I'm slowing down. I actually quiet my voice, right? Paying attention to the different tools in your toolbox. I think I wouldn't want any of us to force ourselves to, uh, well, frankly, be British. So terrible in every way. Um, no, <laughs> like it's more recognizing it, understanding it. And in sometimes um, I talk about, for example, you know, when we go like this, right? I'm just doing this high up so you guys can see me on the screen, right? Sometimes people will say, oh, that's a sign that you're closed off, that you're <laughs> defensive, right? For me, sometimes it's a sign that I'm cold. <laughs> right? You turned on the air conditioning, you're keeping it at like 65 degrees because you're in a suit and I am freezing. Um, and so I'll be explicit about that right? That's part of the social intuition. Let me tell you that I'm doing this because I'm a little chilly and I'm not even going to say, so I'm wrapping my arms around because I'm chilly. It's, I'm going to send you this signal, which you're going to pick up means I'm cold. Or I'm going to say like, Ooh, little, little chilly in here or something like that. <laughs> and again, being aware of those social intuition cues and sometimes mm -hmm. vocalizing them, uh, I think can be effective in terms of disarming them. The last thing I'll say is this whole, oh, women, we shouldn't be emotional, blah, blah, blah. First of all, it's a bunch of crap. Um, second of all, <laughs> crying equals passion for something. And I regularly tell my students, you know, oh, I'm so embarrassed. I'm crying. I'm like, that's, 
I don't give a flying. Like, that's great. It means you care. It means you're passionate about something. It means that it's important to you, right? Let's validate the fact that people feel and express their emotions differently. And we know that you cannot make decisions without emotion, right? We've had all, we've seen all those lovely studies with the people who, you know, have no frontal lobe or the spike went through their head or whatever, you know, the terrible things that happen to people by accident. You cannot make a decision without emotion. So let's stop pretending that. Um, and I think, you know, back to negotiation theory, if people read separate the people from the problem as separate emotion from your thinking, that's not what Roger Fisher meant. And it's also impossible. So stop it. Like, right? Like just so again, own own all of that. And they'll have to adjust. <laughs> Susan. Hey, uh, thank you, Andrea, so much. So can you hear me? Everybody can hear yeah. me? Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, obviously I don't need to tell any of you, we are at a, you know, a critical moment on our planet and uh, uh, who knows where we're headed, how the, how the mother is going to deal with us and all of that. And, um, and I guess I'm wondering what you would say, because you've added so much interesting stuff here. If you had to summarize um, what stands out to you most about how this what you know can support gender equity on the planet because gender equity on the planet is obviously something that is connected to climate, connected to sustainability, connected to poverty. It is connected to everything. And negotiation is kind of the microcosm. Mm -hmm. And so you've, you've given us so much good stuff. If you had to summarize what the main ideas of what's standing out about how this will support gender equity on the planet. Um Okay, I'd say two things. One is, uh, uh, one is stop blaming women for inequity, right? The whole, oh, it's because they don't ask. Oh, it's because they choose to have time with their family. Oh, it's because there's they choose this job versus that job. It's lazy. It's sloppy. It's not true. Knock it off. Mm -hmm. So that stuff just makes me a little batshit crazy, as you can tell, of the you know. Therefore, every company and no manager actually ever needs to review his or her actions to find pay equity. Just stop it. Every company is responsible for making the world the way that it should be and stop blaming individuals for what are large social problems. Um, the second part of this, I think, is, uh, and we're starting to see this more and more, but this global recognition I, I kind of hinted at with some of uh, the studies of leadership, but recognizing and enacting the fact that leaders, um, the, the best leaders have a lot of tools in their toolbox. Mm -hmm. um, we are, we in the United States are quite behind other countries in having examples of that and figuring that out. Um, but there are examples and I think, you know, they're not going back. Mm -hmm. um, and so it really is that, um, you know, once you once you actually see somebody, I mean, even thinking in in our lifetimes, the changes of, of what we've seen as, um, you know, just the, the changes that we've seen, I, I think we're we're moving forward. We're not moving fast enough. I mean, I just finished a study on law firms and women in leadership positions, and you know. I was told 30 years ago, just wait for the numbers to equalize and time will tell and then women will be equally represented. And again, I'm just gonna call BS on all of that, mm -hmm. right? No, change takes action. Mm -hmm. um, and it needs people talking about it and saying it and not waiting for goodwill to magically get it done because that isn't happening. Mm -hmm. um, there are examples out there. There are law firms who have figured out how to have equal numbers of women at the higher paying ranks and in leadership. There are countries who have figured this out. Um, it's not us yet, but. Thank you. Okay. Beth Abila, you had your hand up. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I think that um, the original reason I had my hand up was um, sort of, it has passed, but I did want to ask about perhaps shifting focus a little bit um, away from sort of rehabilitating um, 
you know, women or whomever, you know, tends to be on the low end of, of, of things or seems right. to be seen that way uh, and focus on normalizing a range of behavioral expression. Um, yeah. Do you have studies on that? You know, what, what could you say to that, please? Right. I, I think that really is, I think that's the point, Beth, the whole idea that women are supposed to uh, contort themselves to the, you know, basically the white male ideal is a little crazy. It's also ineffective, um, right? It's, it, that's, you can only be what I, I think what you can be. I think part of what I really hope to get across is like, these are the skills that you need and whether it's from socialization or interest level or whatever it is, you're gonna be better at some of them and not so good at others. And maybe gender plays out in that, maybe ethnicity plays out in that, maybe family order plays out in that. Get good at all of them, right? If you're, I mean, I think, you know, tennis camp, you got a great forehand, well, keep up the good work, but let's work on your backhand. Let's, you know, let's figure out how you can do something else. Um, or, you know, let's change the court and play pickleball because it's too far to run on the big courts these days, right? What, you know, think about what are the other things that you can do as opposed to, again, just I, I, the analogy I continue to use is the hammer. And I say, you know, so much of the advice for women, for women of color has been, well, you know, just swing the hammer harder. <laughs> what? Like, I'm, I'm never going to have that bicep. That's ridiculous. And I got a hammer and it's sufficient. Now, what else do I need? Um, and I think, and, and, you know, I at least always try to caveat, you don't know what's sitting across the table. You don't know why they learned, where they learned their skill set, what their assumptions are about negotiation, um, you know, where, where are their assumptions about you and so on and so forth. And th this um, fitting in a box, I think, is, is, as you say, just silly. Well, I'm sorry if I, if I may follow up. Um, yeah. I'm still not hearing about what... Um, can be done or you know what what opportunities there are to work on uh, shifting mindsets in dominant groups uh, <laughs> right because again the focus came back to well then get new skills or get different skills right. or whatever so I'm, I'm still the one who is um being asked to take the action or exert the effort and so this right. is no 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 i would say that you know the skill set a i think um I think dominant groups, I mean, I've been giving this talk, you know, with some of the gender, like men are, men are not good at this, this, and this for, you know, three, four years, kind of, you know, pandemic, put stuff on hiatus. And I think getting it out there to, you know, say, you're not all that, you guys can't listen worth crap. You're not going to get as much information. You're not, you know, this, that, and the other, I think is important. Um, and I also think, uh, you know, in, in part of the uh, trainings that are happening, whether it's, you know, for neutrals, for lawyers in workplaces, um, that normalizing, uh, and not even normalizing, normalizing sounds so like celebrating that there are different ways of communicating, that there are different assumptions, that there's a range of expression, as you call it, um, needs to be part of uh, the, you know, some of the DEI training that's going on. Now people are saying, oh, you know, the DEI training, it's so big, it's so long and then, and, and, and I, I'm sure you've already seen some of it is great. And some of it is like, you know, kill me now, right? This is <laughs> boring. I, I'm like, if I have to take another one of these little quizzes, la, 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 right? Like you're, some of this is not well done. Um, and at least it's done, right? It, that hasn't even been part of the conversation for so long of celebrating the different ways of communicating and recognizing that uh, it's not just one way to communicate. Um, I think creating better feedback loops. Um, I, you know, again, I, I, I know law firms better than most, uh, but you know, what are our assumptions about how men and women take feedback? Um, and what we see in law firms is when they give feedback to male associates, they'll tell them directly what was wrong with the work and how to improve. And with women, they won't be as direct and as specific. And so the women aren't getting the benefit of, you need to do this in order to become partner, right? Well, stop it. 
you, you've got to figure out if you say you want more women to progress and to make partner, you've got to be equally mean, quote unquote, right? Like figure out more effective ways of communicating. And that is the dominant group that has to change. That That is the senior partners. Stop saying you want one thing and then continuing the actions that just perpetuate the problem that already is. Uh, and I think really specifically outlining for companies, for law firms, for leaders, uh, recognizing the, the different ways of communicating and frankly, recognizing the value. Um, the more we are celebrating the best decisions are made by groups. I, I, I always have in my head, the exam at Marquette, they built a new law school building. It's gorgeous. I loved it. It was great. Faculty were consulted about like high, how, how high should the podium be? And where should the chairs be in the, you know, the classroom and blah, 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 blah. Um, and it turned out that when they were creating the office suites, they never talked to the administrative assistants about how to set up an office suite. You're like, you're idiots. Like here are the women, mostly women of color who run the office and you're not talking to them about how much storage is needed for copy paper, you're a moron, right? And, and you're gonna see the combination of assumptions of education and position and gender and race and all of that. And we're gonna continue to make mistakes about decisions if we are not consulting everybody. Eli Unchik had a really interesting question. Eli, can you can you unmute yourself? Are you still there? Yes, I, I can. Um, thank you. I uh, no, I, I wonder how much uh, a woman or any person's preparedness influences how the other party responds, especially a woman who may uh, assume any kind of demeanor but seems more prepared. I think that overcomes a lot of, a lot of the um, deficiencies in other areas, just as it does with men. Well, I think preparation is the magic power that everybody has in negotiation, right? So much of this that we're talking about today is personality. And let's not pretend that adding or stretching your default communication skills isn't a challenge. It's a challenge for all of us because it really is ingrained um, versus the amount of time you put into preparing. You know, that is absolutely under your power um, and the thing you can control. And <clears throat> there's no question that the more you prepare, the better off you're going to be. I agree wholeheartedly, particularly because it's within our power. Um, and depending on the position of the person you're negotiating with. Um, uh, you know, I could be far better prepared than my dean, but if the dean says no, the dean says no. Uh, and so figuring out all of the lovely, you know, social intuition also goes, for example, this is my previous dean. Um, he had problems saying no to people in person. So I stopped emailing him. <laughs> Why would I ever email him when he can say no to me? Duh, right? Like part of this is figuring out I'm going to walk in the office. I'm going to see you in person because you don't like saying no to me in person. Super cool, right? That's actually, that's not even the substantive preparation. That's preparation on the social intuition skills. Like pay attention to how the people, I mean, many of us at the workplace, we're dealing with the same person over and over and over and over. Learn from it. Kim Reich has her hand up, and then Fran Sapshin. Kim, go ahead. Thanks. So um, I'm going to circle this down. I, I, wanna, I think I want to take us down even further into the data, and it's just that I'm not a negotiation expert. But I, I guess I'm part of my concern around when we start talking about who's better at negotiation is that it's the deciding what the standard for better is, and it seems to always be focused on dollars, who got the higher settlement, who has the higher salary, who has the bigger, those kind right. of things, to, that continual buy-in as to what counts as status, and Carol was talking about what that means for the health of the climate, I think as long as we continue to say success equals more money, more stuff, the ability that that, and so I'm wondering 
what you're finding in terms of the data about that, like, anyway, that's, and I'll leave it there because I don't know the data particularly well. Right, no, Kim, I think it's a really good point. I mean, we tie, you know, again, part of the problem with negotiation research has been, we study assertiveness only, and we study, did you get more money when you asked? Since when is that? Frankly, even most of our day-to-day -day negotiations have nothing to do with money. There are ongoing interactions there for people to take actions or respond to calls or whatever it is. And you're right, if we're looking at salary or money and, and not every other part of your life, um, that seems to me to be unwise. I've, again, tried to pull some of this out. There's been some studies that look at the fact that women are better at negotiating all the other conditions of work. And I've got to say that that definitely resonates with women and men in this generation who know that what they get paid is not the only thing that's going to make them happy in life. Um, that it is, you know, I'm not going to pretend that salary is not a marker, but, uh, you know, I continually hear, you know, I'm not interested in that firm. I want to think about this. I want to, you know, reduce my commute. I want this. I want that. And we've seen you know, this generation of workers be far more concerned than others have been in terms of their work-life balance. I think one of the things I try to do is say, here's the way to make that happen. Make sure you are negotiating not only about salary, that you really have thought about the package of what's going to make you happy um, for both men and women, right? I've had people call, you know, I consult and whatever, and, you know, I'm going to get a raise. It's, I'm getting a new position. I'm getting a raise. You know, what else do I need? I'm like, well, maybe another administrative assistant, maybe more support, right? What's your budget? What's, what is everything else that is going to make you successful, even as you're getting promoted, right? And I, I completely agree that if we're only focusing, if, if money is the only thing that counts, it's the only thing we're counting. Um, and if you're only focusing on money, you're missing the point of what's going to make you successful and happy. Fran. Oh, thanks. Thanks for taking, <clears throat> giving me a moment to speak. I think it's been alluded to, uh, certainly you, Andrea, have spoken about the importance of context in measuring these skills. There's not a single doubt in my mind that women uh, possess the abilities. I think the question is the context in which they're being exercised. And I think it was alluded to in terms of um, gender equity, racial equity. I mean, you find yourself in powerful environments which are not friendly. And for that to, and so that impacts your ability to effectively exercise those skills. And what's missing is what's the motivation to change the system? I, I am much older than many that are on this call. And I remember when I started in a law firm, there were virtual, my class was probably the first class of a substantial number of women. There was no motivation to change things. I like to think that it's changed a little bit, but I have contact with young women in law firms and so many of the issues that I experienced 30 years ago are still at play for women, people of color. Um, so the question is, how do we shift the paradigm? And I, I would say that more women in the workplace hasn't shifted what you refer to as success uh, and, and making partner and making money. I mean, yeah, I'd say on an individual level, that may not be your measure of success, but let's just lo look at the big picture because people always make trade-offs for what they want in life. But women and people of color in those environments, the imposter syndrome is huge. Yep. You are not really able to be as effective. Just. No, I think you're right, Fran. I think um, one of the things that uh, I've been working on, um, you know, one of the things that struck me is the the, the pretty successful and, you know, however you measure it, interestingly successful push to put women on boards. Um, that once you uh, had, uh, you know, in the early 2000, 2010 or whatever, it kind of started out, there weren't women on corporate boards and 
you know, the, the, con the explanation was, well, they're not women who are qualified. We don't know where to find them. We couldn't possibly do this, blah, 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 blah. And once you have reports that are making it more transparent, that companies are being held to account. Um, I've seen it even in Milwaukee, which, you know, is a medium sized, lovely backwards Midwest place in a purple state that is wildly gerrymandered. It's nice to move to a place where my vote matters. Um, but anyway, uh, <laughs> I could go down that rabbit hole any day. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, Milwaukee's not at the fort vanguard of, of social change. And yet, just even reporting on the percentage of women in boards for the last five years in the state of Wisconsin has moved the numbers 10%, which was insane. Um, you know, that it's, it's now at like 25%, they're aiming for 30%. Should it take this long? No. Is it really <laughs> annoying? Yes. Does transparency help? Yes. Um, and I think part of this is um, the, the next article out is, again, I, I was running an Institute for Women's Leadership in, at Marquette before I came here, and we studied law firms and just starting to do the same kind of reporting. What's the percentage of equity partners? What's the percentage of women at the highest end? Um, again, Fran, that's uh, and and to uh, and to Kim's point, right? We're celebrating money. Um, you know, I think you've got to have two things. So if we're going to be, you know, if we are still measuring the top earners and partners and whatever, we we do have to make those numbers more transparent. Um, I think you still have another generation of women going into law firms thinking that if they keep their head down and they work hard, that they're magically going to be rewarded for it, and that is bullshit. Um, and, and I tell my students that, and I'm like, and here are the questions you need to ask, and here's what you need to know. Um, and I wish I could tell you differently. And it is incredibly enraging that 30 years later, I, I mean, I have an article from 1994 on how to deal with offensive comments, like when you're asked to get coffee, or you're told you speak English so well, um, or, you know, <laughs> when did your parents land? Um, or, and you're like, I'm sorry, that should be outdated. That should be in the archives. That shouldn't be timely. Um, and it is timely. And I'm actually going to update it because now we would call that a microaggression. We've got new language, but the answer is frustratingly still the same. Uh, and I just one more comment, uh, you know, numbers, numbers are nice. It's, it's great to see more women moving into those positions, but yep. it also isn't a full measure no. of how they are regarded, the no. level of respect that they receive. Or is it some kind of tokenism? Absolutely. Right. You folks are also making huge assumptions that women are collaborative and cooperative. I have been in the workplace for over 50 years. And primarily, I have had women supervisors. The amount of jealousy and competition <laughs> when you are not the absolute supervisor or the medical director, which I've always been in mid-level management, is quite a rough road. The ability to prosper or take on new responsibilities or show leadership ability, that is why I left my last position, you know? And it's not funny, it's not a joke because I'm a collaborative consensus builder. And when you're working up against women who are competitive and have to hold the hierarchy, <laughs> You're up against the same problem if it's a man or a woman. And don't try to assert yourself and don't try to show any leadership abilities. So what do you do? You try to find another workplace and another workplace. But, you know, particularly in the healthcare field, women went to medical school. The, a level of competition that they had to match up against, particularly women, I'm in my 60s, they are still carrying that. They have not been trained in consensus building. They know nothing about collaboration. They know about it's my brain and I make the decisions. <laughs> and so I don't think necessarily think medical training has, has shifted at all either necessarily. We can say, oh, yay, women are in the field. Mm -hmm. That's making a huge assumption that there's a different paradigm. There's not. And it's there's sad. A there's a lot of people nodding, Kathy. 
Thank you. Javi has her hand up too. Thank you. Um, Kathy, how refreshing and thank you. Um, that's wonderful. I've got a, I've got a couple of skunk at the garden party things as well. Um, uh, I, with respect to the field of mediation, especially mediating lawsuits, um, it's all very well to say and, and be true that women can be better uh, at helping people find a meaningful, durable uh, resolution and so forth. The problem or the, the counterpart to that is that the parties don't hire the, the, the mediator, the lawyers do. And the <laughs> lawyers, by the time you get to that end of the litigation, they don't want a nice problem solver. They want somebody who will, as I put it, separate the parties and beat them into submission. <laughs> okay, that is mediation. And that is partly why mediation is so cliquish. If you want to break into the field, good luck, Barbara. <laughs> okay. The other thing to observe is that more broadly speaking in, in negotiation, it's all very well to say need, uh, women need to be more assertive and so forth and say, look, this is what I expect. This is what I, I need from you with the implied, if I don't get it, I'll go someplace else. The problem is it is very real that in a lot of settings, the person on the other side of the desk will say, bye, have a nice life, okay? So all that assertiveness can end up getting you exactly what they think you're ready to do, which is get nothing. And so uh, asserting um, has sometimes a very dear price. And that's part of the reality. Absolutely, Javi. I think all of these things one needs to continue to think about. Look, I mean, my take is always we should, you should understand the tools in the toolbox and you are the judge to use them wisely in the situation that you're, that you're in. And I think, Kathy, your point about, no, no, no. I mean, power and hierarchy, as I've said, often play a far bigger role than gender. And so making assumptions about what's going on across the table because of somebody's gender only, uh, I think is highly unwise, as, as you've said. And uh, thank you so much, everyone, and especially to Andrea for an absolutely fabulous presentation. We are at that 10 o'clock point. We will be turning off the recording. Uh, Andrea has agreed to hang around for just a few minutes. She has another presentation, so we will uh, for sure end this informal part by 10.15. Um, we are now turning off, and uh, you're welcome to chat informally with Andrea. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And again, thank you, Andrea. It's been a real you, treat Lori. this morning. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for all the lovely comments. Feel free to speak if you have a question for Andrea. Just unmute yourself and say 